Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elisa Waddell, and I am the Chief of Community Health and Prevention here with the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. I would like to welcome you to today's interactive webinar, How State Health Agencies Can Partner to Increase Access and Coverage of Long-Acting Reversible Contraceptives for Teens and Postpartum Women. ASTO, with support from the Health Resources and Services Administration, is working to highlight examples of Medicaid and public health partnerships. Since 2014, ASTO's maternal and child health team, with the support of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, has been supporting a virtual learning community with several states to identify technical assistance needs and promising practices to assist current states and future states as they work to advance the increased utilization of LARPs, long-acting reversible contraceptives. ASTO is currently in the process of identifying six additional states to participate in the immediate postpartum LARP learning community for a second year of this project. This webinar today features teams from three of the current states. Colorado, South Carolina, and Iowa, who will talk about their work in the collaborative and lessons learned. The objectives for today's webinar are as follows. To gain an understanding of LARCs, including the benefits for specific populations like teens and postpartum women, particularly in the immediate postpartum period, Describe the business case for providing coverage and increased access to LARPs. To understand the public health department's role in increasing access to LARPs. And to describe how Medicaid agencies and public health departments have partnered to increase access to LARPs. We have an esteemed panel of experts that will, speaking, who, that will be speaking with you today. Following my introductions, all of the speakers will present their slides. If you have a question, you are welcome to post it in the chat box on your screen at any time during the webinar. These questions will be used during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. You will also have an opportunity to chat any additional questions during the Q&A session. At the end of today's webinar, you will be directed to an evaluation survey. This is very important to us, so please take a few minutes to inform us about challenges and barriers that you are experiencing in your states in providing access to LARCs, and provide us with feedback on today's webinar as well. So our speakers today are Dr. Larry Wolk, Ms. Ellen Pliska, Ms. Greta Klinger, Ms. Beezy Gaze, and Ms. Deborah Kane. First, let me introduce Dr. Wolk. Dr. Larry Wolk is the Executive Director and Chief Medical Officer of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Before coming to the department, Dr. Wolk served as the Chief Executive Officer of the Colorado Rio, Colorado's nonprofit health information exchange. He was an executive with the correctional health care companies, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Colorado, Prudential Healthcare of Colorado, and Cigna Healthcare. In 1996, Dr. Wolk founded the Rocky Mountain Youth Clinics, one of Colorado's largest safety net clinics and a national model for providing care to uninsured when he, where he continues to practice medicine. Ms. Ellen Pliska is the Family and Child Health Director with ASTO. She is responsible for managing federally funded budgets, projects, and contracts under the Maternal and Child Health portfolio of projects. She manages the ASTO Healthy Babies Initiative and the Long-Acting Reversible Contraceptive Learning Community, which provides technical assistance uh, to states and helps to facilitate say, state successes. Previously, uh, Ellen uh, has served as the Maternal and Child Health Analyst and a Senior Analyst here at ASTO. Following Ella, Ellen, we will hear from Greta Klinger, uh, Greta Klinger is the Director of Colorado's Family Planning Initiative at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. She has spent the past seven years working to increase access to family planning services in Colorado, 
specifically focusing on increasing use of the most effective contraceptive methods. Following her, we will hear from Beezy Gazay. Beezy is the director of the South Carolina Birth Outcomes Initiative and has worked in the private and public health care sector for over 38 years. She has experience in hospital, pharmaceutical, and state government settings, and she also is serving as an adjunct professor at the USC School of Public Health and uh, in the Health and Policy Program. She will bring uh, a tremendous amount of Medicaid expertise to this discussion. And then we will hear from Deborah Kane. Deborah is currently uh, a Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Maternal and Child Health Epidemiologist assigned to the Iowa Department of Public Health, the Bureau of Family Health in Des Moines. Ms. Kane is also an adjunct assistant professor at the Des Moines uh, University College of Health Sciences. And Ms. Kane received her PhD in 2003 from the University of Illinois, Chicago. So we are very, very excited and pleased um, to have this panel of experts with us today. And we thank all of you for joining and participating in today's webinar. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Wolk. Thank you, Lisa, and good morning, everyone, and uh, happy Monday. Um, I was asked just to give a, a couple of uh, remarks uh, with regard to the leadership perspective on LARCs, drawing on our experience here in Colorado and um, why we initiated uh, the work that we did here and what are some first steps to engage uh, leadership and other stakeholders and, and what kind of lessons uh, do we continue to learn along the way. Um, I'm not going to steal uh, uh, much of Greta's thunder because um, she's the real expert and uh, I'm very glad that uh, you'll all be able to hear from her with regard to the details of our program. But uh, you know, quite frankly, um, back in the, the mid-2000s, um, Colorado had a, a very high rate of unintended um, teen pregnancy. Um, and also a, a very low rate uh, of long-acting methods. Um, with uh, the um, opportunity uh, that a not-so-anonymous funder uh, provided us, uh, we initiated um, the Family Planning Initiative in, in 2009 so that uh, we could really um, address uh, this uh, high unintended uh, teen pregnancy rate uh, with trying to increase uh, the, the long-acting method um, use. Um, and so, um, you know, I think uh, you, you'll hear a lot about and, and may have uh, actually already heard a lot about uh, the success of the program, but uh, a couple of things as far as how to engage um, uh, other leadership and stakeholders is for, first and foremost to really focus on the core uh, as we did here in Colorado and that core really being uh, the Title X funded agencies. Um, without that core, without that partnership, without um, you know really being able to utilize those experts, um, we wouldn't have been able to make the impact uh, that we did. And um, so the, the funding that we had was provided to um, 28 different Title X funded agencies in more than half of Colorado's counties, uh, but those counties really accounted for 95% uh, of the state's total population and 95% of, of our low-income population. And like I said, you'll, you'll hear more about that. Um, the second piece was to, to really get tight uh, relative to messaging, uh, that this isn't really just about unintended pregnancies, but um, really the downstream effects uh, of those unintended pregnancies. And, and, and very quickly, uh, we included in our messaging uh, the data and the statistics as it related to abortions and terminations and um, the significant impact that um, making available and, and seeing an increase in use of long-acting reversible contraceptives had on the abortion rates amongst this population. As well as then the third piece, which is the public costs, the, the cost avoidance pieces as it relates to Medicaid and WIC and, and other public assistance programs because that then really allows for um, uh, bipartisan support uh, because you're touching on a number of issues uh, that um, really appeal to both sides uh, of the aisle. 
Having said that, uh, as it relates to lessons learned and, and the messages themselves, um, I, I certainly observed a, a shifting in um, how critics would try to take the program down or, or belittle or demean the program. Uh, the first of which is the argument that these uh, are abortive fashions, uh, if that's even a word, uh, and that uh, LARC uh, really uh, contributes to abortions um, rather than prevents them. And uh, thanks to strong clinical support uh, and um, you know really drawing on on evidence, we were quickly able to address that and 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 take that message down. Um, so the critics then shifted to an ACA-like message, saying, "Well, we're already paying for the ACA and Obamacare, uh, and these things should be provided as part of that. Why do you need additional funding, and why should we be paying twice?" And so I think you'll hear from uh, Greta uh, some of uh, the reasons that we talk about uh, with regard to public and private insurance coverage and uh, some of the, the issues that I think we've all faced as it relates to, one, not everyone is insured or insurable, two, even if you are insured, uh, obtaining uh, confidential services is not something that insurers are, are often able to uh, accommodate. Um, and so there has to be some sort of mechanism uh, or opportunity as a result of that. Uh, and so the, the, there's a number of challenges and, and arguments that have taken that down. Uh, we've heard the argument that, uh, well, there's increased amount of sexual activity. There must be an increase in um, the incidence of sexually transmitted infections and diseases. And uh, that simply wasn't the case and wasn't our experience here in Colorado. There's been no increase of reported sexual activity and certainly no increase in sexually transmitted infections. In fact, um, uh, we've seen a decrease. So um, for us going forward, uh, as we uh, embrace uh, the ACA and embrace this program and the results, uh, we really feel there's a continued need for additional funding, primarily in, in three strategic areas. Uh, one is um, some sort of inventory program, uh, what I call the VFC for IUDs program, where um, clinics outside of that core of the Title X funded clinics, but including them, uh, as well as the, uh, the rest of the safety net, is give them an opportunity to have some inventory program where you take the burden of pre-purchasing and stocking IUDs and long-acting hormonal contraceptives uh, away through um, additional funding. Uh, there's still a, a training piece uh, that um, we think is missing as it relates to, again, folks uh, who are part of the safety net and, and outside of um, the Title X funded clinics where pediatricians, family practitioners, other folks uh, who are engaged and involved in providing primary care and uh, services to this population uh, need to be taught and retaught how to um, work with these type of contraceptives so it's as easy to implant and insert as it is to write a prescription for oral contraceptives or, or to hand out um, condoms. And then the last piece is a public education piece, which is, of course, core to public health uh, with regard to dispelling the myths. Um, as it relates to IUDs especially, uh, as well as the long-acting hormonal contraceptives. Uh, as we say, uh, these are not your mother's IUDs, um, and uh, there's a lot that needs to continue to occur with regard to public education um, in this area. So those are just um, some of the nuggets and um, some of the pieces that um, Greta will now be charged uh, with uh, tying together as uh, we get into her presentation in a little bit. Uh, very excited and, and thank ASSO for the opportunity um, to speak and to bring everyone together. And at this point, I'll turn it back over to Ellen Pliska. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolk. Um, we appreciate learning about some of your leadership um, at the State of Colorado. Um, I'm Ellen Pliska. I'm the Family and Child Health Director at ASSO, and I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about our immediate postpartum LARC learning community, um, what's been happening over the last year, and next steps. So ASTO's uh, LARC immediately postpartum learning community is built to really improve state capacity to successfully help states implement LARCs immediately postpartum within their hospitals and really help them uh, bridge those partnerships 
across uh, the multi-sectors, hospitals, um, the providers, a hospital association, uh, education um, outlets, um, and other areas, Medicaid, health department, um, to really make those up and running within the state to increase access to LARCs for women in that postpartum period. And what we're really doing as part of this learning community is facilitating state-to-state -state sharing, so getting states to really help one another move their policies and programs forward. We're providing some technical assistance, and that's around areas like improving their um, uh, Medicaid policies, um, increasing uh, training within their states and some other areas. And we are also helping uh, develop, uh, states learn how to do this by developing state stories, tools, um, and toolkits around state solutions um, and materials. Um, we are developing all of these based on key informant interviews, which we are doing with all of these states that are involved, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, we're picking up on those challenges and successes from each state to really learn about what's going well and how states can improve in certain areas. And then, as I said before, we're doing um, capturing those state stories, developing tools. We are also holding virtual learning sessions for each of those states, and we held five in year one and are planning four in year two, and more on that in a minute. Um, but in year one, we did focus on training, reimbursement, and sustainability consent and stocking and supply, and we're looking forward to increasing those uh, areas in year two. We are working with the states that are on the map that you can see on the screen. Uh, they are Colorado, Georgia, Iowa, Massachusetts, New Mexico, and South Carolina. You'll notice that three of them are on our webinar today. And so you'll hear a little bit more about some of the great things they're working on either in LARCs immediately postpartum or um, beyond such as uh, teen pregnancy issues and some other areas. And we are very pleased to be partnering closely uh, with the CDC as our main funder and collaborator on this project and uh, some other partners including uh, ACOG, uh, the um, Obstetrician and Gynecologist Association, AMCHIP, which is the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs located within the state health agencies, um, CMS, so Medicaid, uh, the National Family Planning and Reproductive Health Association, and the Office of Population Affairs. I am extremely pleased to say that we are um, accepting uh, applications, or I guess letters of interest, for our second cohort of the uh, LARC learning community. And you can see the um, invitation letters on the screen there. And what we'll be doing is accepting letters of intent uh, signed by the State Health Commissioner due by September 8th, and these are for states who have already have either a Medicaid policy in place or some other payment policy in place for LARC immediately postpartum. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that, and my email will be on the next screen. Um, and we are thrilled to be hosting another kickoff meeting in October and an additional four virtual learning sessions moving forward. If you would like any access to any of our materials as developed through that learning community, please don't hesitate to click on that link on the screen or contact me um, at my email below. I am now pleased to uh, hand it off to Greta Klingler of the Colorado Department of Health. Greta? Thank you, Ellen. Um, and thanks, everybody. I'm excited to talk to you today. Um, I am going to – some of you, I recognize some names on here, so some of this may be redundant, but there's going to be some new stuff on the end, so I apologize if this is a repeat for anybody, but I also see a lot of new names. So thanks, everybody, who's joining us today. Um, I was hoping that my um, colleague Jody Camp was actually going to be here as well today, but she is, as we speak, meeting with our Division of Insurance and the Insurance Commissioner here in Colorado, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in just a minute. So she's not able to be here today. Um, just to give everybody a little bit of background beyond what Dr. Walk shared, I'm going to give you um, an idea of what we've done here in Colorado over the past seven years. Um, between 2008 and 2014, we've provided over, it's actually 36,000 long-acting reversible contraceptive devices to women here in Colorado. I act, on Thursday, I think I got that updated number, so my apologies for the, the outdated number already. Our teen birth rate has dropped 
actually 48 percent between 2009 and 2014. Abortions have decreased 35 percent. Um, we did some, some return on investment da um, data analysis and looking at Medicaid costs related to um, prenatal care, labor and delivery costs, and first year infant costs. And we estimate that we've saved about $79 million just over the first three years of the program. Um, over the seven years that we've had the program in place, it's been an investment of about $27 million. And there was really um, some main components that we focused on, one of which was training for healthcare providers. We supported operational infrastructure at our Title X clinics, which are the federally funded family planning clinics here in Colorado. And that was um, everything from electronic health records to um, additional staff, clinic improvements, whatever clinics felt they needed to better serve their clients. And then, of course, um, the, the biggest piece was reducing or eliminating the actual cost of LARC devices. Um, as Dr. Wilk mentioned, we received private funding for the initiative, which bolstered our existing state and federal family planning funding here in Colorado. And when we looked at provider training and public education, we wanted to make sure that we were increasing access to services and specifically focusing on increasing access to long-acting reversible contraceptives. We have a fantastic network of family planning clinics here, but just based on cost alone, they were really limited in what they were able to provide. Um, the funding was provided by an anonymous donor. For the first four years, it was about $5 million a year, and then a little bit less in years five, six, and seven. And it was distributed to all 28 of our Title X agencies throughout the state. Um, that meant we had services in 69 clinics. And Dr. Wolk touched on this as well. We were located in 36 of the 64 counties here in Colorado, but those 36 counties are home to 95% of our population. So while there are gaps, we do have reach to the, the vast majority of the state's population here. And just for um, some context, 42 of those clinics are actually located in, in local public health departments. The rest are a mix of hospitals, private nonprofits, federally qualified community health centers, and the like. Um, this next slide will show you a map of kind of where our clinics are. And you can see um, the big green kind of bulk is, is there in the Denver metro area and then we're kind of spread across the state throughout. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Colorado, the Eastern Plains are um, all designated as either rural or frontier counties, which is even less population density than frontier. And then west of the Denver metro area, the Front Range, is the mountains and the western slope. And, and those areas can be very, very isolated. And so we have some challenges getting out and making sure that, that we have access to care for folks in those communities. Um, just a little snapshot of some of the outcomes that we've seen. When we first started, within our Title X um, clinics, we saw less than 1% of our um, young women ages 15 to 24, which is our primary population we serve, um, getting a, a, a LARC method each year. And now we're up to almost 10% are receiving one of those methods newly each year. Um, our LARC use among that same population was under 5%. It was just 4%. And we're actually now almost at 30% within our Title X population, which is just phenomenal. And one of the interesting things we've seen when we first started, we had 44% of our Title X clients using an oral contraceptive method. And now that's down to just under 30%. And so what we're seeing is women choosing to move from less effective methods to more effective methods, which is great. And then um, for our teen fertility rates, looking, looking at what's going on, in 2008 it was 39.6 births per 1,000 women. And actually in 2014 we're now down to 19. Um, which is just a phenomenal drop for the state to see. We're really excited to see those numbers shifting. And what's also interesting is when you break them down, we're seeing the disparities between 
low-income women and, and higher-income women or among minority populations and whites lessen. So the disparities are shrinking and all of the populations are coming closer and closer in line with each other, which is also great for us to see. And this is just going to be a graphic representation of some of that fertil teen fertility data. You can see both the rates as well as the actual numbers of births on this slide. And I have to thank Sue Ricketts, who I think is on listening mode right now um, for putting together all of this data and, and doing such a wonderful job helping us with the analysis and really looking at what's going on. Um, some of the other impacts we've seen beyond the teen birth rate dropping, um, as I mentioned, we've seen a big decrease in abortion numbers here in Colorado. We've seen um, our WIC enrollment drop following the same pattern as we've seen with these other data indicators, which was very interesting. And then we've seen this big Medicaid savings as well. Um, what I really want to talk about with this um, is kind of all the administrative payment and logistical work that has gone into it. We've worked very, very closely with our Medicaid office here in Colorado, the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. And they've been key to this, not just to the success of what we've done, but really making sure that this is a lasting benefit for the women of Colorado. Um, and I think the, the first thing that I really want to highlight as being important is building that relationship. We meet very regularly with the staff that, that kind of impacts our work most closely. And at the very least, we have a check-in call with them once a month. Sometimes they're five minutes long and it's really nothing but pleasantries and how are you. But oftentimes there's questions on both ends that we're able to help each other out. And because we have that standing relationship, it makes it much easier when something does come up to, to reach out and get those um, questions addressed. And one of those examples is this cost avoidance data that we worked on. We were able to work with Medicaid, get some additional data, and have their folks look over our numbers and make sure that everybody was in agreement with what we were coming up with. We also had an outside contractor um, billing and coding specialist come in and develop a billing and coding manual for our clinics that kind of go through the ins and outs, not just of billing and coding best practices, but some of the particular nuances that are specific to Colorado Medicaid. For those of you that work with Medicaid in your states, you know that there's all kinds of state-specific issues and rules and codes that come into play to make sure that people are getting reimbursed um, for the services that they're delivering. And our contractor that developed that manual worked very closely with our partners at Medicaid to make sure that um, all of that was correct and that they were making the, the right statements. There's been wonderful leadership collaboration between Dr. Wolk, our executive director, and the director over at Medicaid. And it's so helpful to have that there and, and have the leadership that's able to step in when the, our program staff on either end is struggling with something and, and have that extra support there. Um, I believe it was two years ago, we were actually able to work with Medicaid and work with the state legislature to get a across the board reimbursement rate increase for all, almost all reproductive health services, which was huge. And what they did is we had some advocates that were able to um, increase all of the reproductive health codes to 105% of the Medicare rates. And in many cases, that was a really, really significant jump. And so it was a huge boon to our, both our providers as well as other safety net providers offering reproductive health services to get payment for services that's much more in line with what it actually costs them to deliver. Um, we try to make sure whenever possible to have our Medicaid staff attend our family planning related conferences and meetings. Um, we've had a Medicaid participant in the ASTO learning community, which has just been fantastic. And we try to include them knowing that one, it's an opportunity for them to see face to face the impact of their work, but also get questions answered and keep that communication going. So it's been really great. 
Um, several years ago, we brought up the, the issue of postpartum LARC reimbursement for hospitals where it was, as in most states, the actual cost of the device would just be wrapped into the global labor, labor and delivery rate and hospitals were hesitant to do that and then eat the cost of what for them could be an eight or a $900 device. And so Medicaid responded super quickly here and developed a process on their end to create a carve out that now when um, an IUD or an implant is inserted before a woman leaves the hospital, that device is reimbursed separate from the global labor and delivery rate, which is great. Um, they're almost in the process of, of making live a carve out for rural health centers in the same way. Our rural health centers here in Colorado get paid a capitated rate, it's very low. And for them to provide a long acting reversible contraceptive device, they, they just can't. They lose so much money on it. And Medicaid heard that loud and clear here. And they went to the um, feds and advocated for a carve out there. And that should be, if it's not live now, it should be live in the next couple of months, which is just phenomenal. And then we're, we're having the similar discussions related to federally qualified community health centers. And we haven't come up with an agreeable solution on that one yet, but we're working towards it. So certainly working through various payment issues, reimbursement issues as they come up, but that, that existing relationship is really what has made any of this possible in the first place. Um, looking at some kind of insights and lessons learned, what we found, and, and Dr. Wolk touched on this a little bit, was most helpful here in Colorado was partnering with existing systems, at least at the beginning, to use a, a phrase that may not be the, the greatest, is looking at the low-hanging fruit. We have all of our Title X clinics who are already on board and very well trained in this work. They just needed a little extra support. And same with the FQHCs. This is a part of the services that they have to deliver, and they want to do it in the best way possible, but sometimes they just need a little extra. Um, within those clinics, though, even the ones that were on board, champions are key to meaningful change and making sure that there's someone with some influence and respect in that clinical setting that can really help push, support, and advocate for the changes that are necessary, whether they be on the business side, whether they're on the clinical protocol side, or whatever it might be. They're, they're really key to making sure that there's meaningful change there. One of the interesting things we also learned was that the clinical training didn't end with just the providers. There was a huge piece associated with clinic efficiency as well as the back end with billing and coding that were essential to making sure that clinics really could break down the barriers for patients accessing LARC. One of them, we try whenever possible in our clinics, and some aren't able to do it, but to offer same day insertions and that, that changes the way a clinic is going to flow. It changes the scheduling pattern and what the staffing looks like. And making sure that everybody from the front desk staff to the MAs to the RNs, everybody who's there needs to be on board. Um, of course, following best pl clinical practices and guidelines, the CDC, in partnership with the Office of Population Affairs, released the quality family planning guidelines last year, and they are just essential. And it's a great, great tool for those who aren't part of Title X to have the best possible family planning guidelines to go by. Data is always great. I think we learned along the way we were set up initially to collect a lot of really good stuff, but we definitely learned along the way it would have been nice to have some other things. So I think being able to have some foresight and, and make sure that you're collecting the data that you need is always helpful. And then being able to look at it and use it on the back end is also, also key to help, helping make the case. Um, making sure that, that we're able to increase access to all LARC. And that means in all clinical settings, as I mentioned, same day insertions. Cost is really a huge piece. And that's a huge piece for the patient. It's also a huge piece piece for the providers. And that leads us into coverage by payers. And, and the Affordable Care Act has certainly increased access hugely. But as, as that gets implemented and we have more and more people with health coverage, we're having to face other issues and making sure that everybody truly has the access that they're legally afforded. 
Um, and so part of that is increasing knowledge among clients, what, what they're entitled to, what they have access to. Um, and we found that word of mouth is really invaluable, but, but they also have, there's a lot of education that needs to be done in terms of understanding their coverage, how to access services. And so I, I do have to also call out here in Colorado, we are very fortunate to have incredibly supportive minor consent laws. Minors here in Colorado of any age can consent to reproductive health services without their parents. Um, and that's huge. And, and that leads us into the confidentiality piece. And with insurance expanding and more and more young people covered by their parents' insurance plans, and also adults who might be covered by a partner's plan who are coming to seeking, seek services that they don't want anyone else to be aware of, they're sometimes afraid of insurance communication going home and disclosing what's happened. And so we're working with the Division of Insurance right now to try and address that here in Colorado. But that's kind of a snapshot of, of what we've done. My contact information is there as well as Jody's. You're welcome to reach out to any of us um, if you have any questions or anything like that. And I just want to thank you for, for your time and giving us a chance to share our story. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to BZ Gazay in South Carolina. Thank you, Greta. And thank you particularly to Lisa and Ellen and Courtney for allowing South Carolina to get to shine a light on what we've done in the state, um, particularly looking at how we became the first state in the nation to pay outside the DRG under the Medicaid policy, and then also what we're doing now to promote more utilization, to help our providers and also help our moms. Next slide. So there is little South Carolina on the coast in the red. We have about 4.5 million total population with a Medicaid population of 1.3 million. We use this map to indicate the states in blue who have contacted us and ask us for assistance in one of the eight different projects that we have that falls under the South Carolina Birth Outcomes Initiative. So we're very proud of this. And if you're a state that's still in white, uh, give us a call. Uh, or if you're in blue, we'd love to talk with you again. Next slide. Selling points that you will need to know as you move forward, key stakeholders, also how do you develop the partnerships. Next slide. <clears throat> so the first question to consider is, who is your Medicaid policy decision maker? In most states, in the majority of the states, this is your Medicaid director. This person reports to the governor in most cases. There are a couple of states that we have talked to where the state legislature themselves, the House and Senate, make decisions for Medicaid. So the director does not have much power at all. But the majority of times, you're going to need to get to the director. The good news is you don't have to have CMS approval on this. We learned that uh, when we began looking at making this change, we did share our bulletin and our changes with CMS, but they gave us the go ahead. So the biggest question then is how do you get the director's attention and approval for the change? Next slide. Fortunately for us, and I know this is not the case in all states, we have developed over the last four years the Birth Outcomes Initiative that for 49 consecutive months has had over 100 stakeholders from around South Carolina come together at a monthly meeting and join part of one, any one of these work groups. And it has provided the foundation for us in the work groups to listen to what is important to hassle factors, to payment reform, what are some of the issues that we can do to affect policy that will make life better for our providers and particularly our moms and our babies. So you just see this is a, a picture of one of our work groups and there are our six that we work through. Next slide. Sell, sell, sell. <laughs> You've got to talk the benefits to help moms and Medicaid. Now, of course, because we're Medicaid, you've got to talk about costs, but you also have to talk about health outcomes for the moms. 
most likely one that everybody knows is changing the policy was going to reduce our number of repeat and unintended births. It would remove the barrier to postpartum appointments. We have an abysmal rate uh, of 55% here in South Carolina don't come back for it. And then something that we always want to remember is how can we improve provider relationships? And this gave us the opportunity to identify a barrier at the time that we launched the uh, policy, which was that our reimbursement amount at the time now, just for outpatient, to our physician was less than what they had to pay for it when they were ordering it on buy and bill. So we changed that, we upped the price, uh, for outpatient and inpatient. Next slide. Two more. This is really important. A lot of states don't realize when you're talking about Medicaid and a match, this is 90-10. It's family planning. So the feds put up 90% of the cost and the state only had to put up 10%. It's huge. And then also, if you need to do a return on investment, then you can look at what the cost of a LARC is versus the oral contraceptive and what that failure rate is. And we're going to touch on that at the end of the slides. Next slide. So take a look at the codes here. Our previous reimbursement, which is in that um, first column, prior to changing them in October of 2012, you'll see what the prices were. The current reimbursement is in the next column. Note under uh, next plan on that we went originally from 648 to 712, but as most of you know, Merck came up with a 17 or 18% increase in the cost of uh, their product. So we did up it. That is quite rare, really, for a Medicaid agency to, to change that price within a few months of when the drug manufacturers increased it. For us, it was a matter of need. We had done so much work to promote LARCs that we felt like we did not want to turn the clock back. And we were hearing in some of our BOI work groups that providers were starting to say, well, I'm not going to lose $50, so I'm just I'm going to stop doing LARCs altogether. There's the insertion code in the next column and then the rates that are used for that. Next slide. So the key players, and Colorado mentioned this, the clinical champions who deliver the babies in a hospital. In South Carolina, about 65% of our of our practices are owned by the hospital, and that is increasing. So if, if I am a physician or an MFM, OBGYN, <clears throat> excuse me, and I go to the CFO and the CEO of the hospital and say, I deliver babies here, I want this to happen, it is going to happen in a lot of cases, but you've got to have those champions. The nurses on the floor are key. They're going to help get the what we call the tackle box ready uh, for insertion that can be done within five minutes. The pharmacy department, they've got to understand how they've got to have the LARC on the unit. The claims department, utilizing your Medicaid claims and outreach staff. And then also the managed care medical directors. They will tell you that they need 90 days to get their payment system ready if they're going to copy our fee-for-service policy. Next slide. So because we have 90% of all of our births, Medicaid births, in the state are covered under one of six MCOs, we are very in tune to keeping them abreast and keeping them at the table. They also attend our BOI meetings every month. The cost for the device, the insertion, and the removal are included in the MCO's capitated rates. And this is done by uh, actuarially sound phenomenon that <laughs> Milliman, our actuaries, put together. But there is no reason for an MCO in our state not to offer inpatient and outpatient insertion because they get it in their cap rates. So you'll see on the third bullet that white bagging, which I'm going to talk about, and the medical buy-in bill, which is the old way and still a way to buy LARCs, as well as the inpatient, are available through the MCOs. Next slide. Lessons learned are always a good thing. The, the previous director um, in which I started the birth outcomes program here at the agency four years ago always said, be easy, tell the whole story, don't skip anything. 
So I want to tell you the good and the bad for us. Next slide. First of all, we went an entire year here thinking that we were reimbursing outside the DRG, and all of our doctors were very happy telling us that until one of our largest hospitals came and said, we're not getting paid outside the DRG. Well, we would think that a hospital would know that prior to a year, but what that told us is we moved ahead very quickly in, in the Medicaid world within three months of learning about this obstacle to actually releasing the bulletin and implementing the policy. And we did not align our systems appropriately with it. So from day one, have those people at Medicaid that know your system sitting at the table with you. Of course, we've mentioned keeping DMCOs informed so they're ready to launch. Key was, and still remains to this day because we do education now, is to provide the opportunity for educational conference calls, any meetings in person that need to be done with the Medicaid staff and a hospital, and it needs to be with the billing managers of the hospital, the other key players that I mentioned, the pharmacy, anybody who's going to have a hands-on needs to be aware of what's going on, and that is during and after the implementation of the policy. Next slide. You've got to be prepared on the get-go to answer questions for the late adopters. I remember being on a call with another state early on. There was a physician on the call, and, and he said, well, the, uh, the fact that the um, its expulsion rate is 45% when you do it immediately postpartum. Well, that's not the case. Uh, you can look at the mega-analysis. You can look at your own state's data. What we have found is for immediate insertion here, it is probably 15 to 17 percent. That is higher than the much less than 5 percent if you do it um, as an outpatient. But ACOG and CDC have promoted inpatient insertion saying that that risk um, well outweighs every other possibility. So keep that in mind as, as you look at um, anticipated thoughts of what people might say. Collaborating with other stakeholders, again, key for BOI to target right now for us um, those pregnancies of the teen moms like Colorado. And then also one of the things that has kept us from having really robust data at this time is because we have such a high infiltration of MCOs, we did not know that in the 146-page contract that each of those MCOs signed, that there was an opt-out that they did not have to fill in that field outside the DRG, which of course you have to when you're billing for the LARC. So we changed that when we currently learned about it. 90% uh, of, of one of our plans was filling it in all the time and another plan was doing it 10%. Next slide. So a couple of things on our inpatient numbers and then our white bagging percentages, and I'll go into the um, policy in a second. Next slide. We have gone basically, and this is fee-for-service and MCOs, even though we have transitioned now um, to the fully capitated, we still are about 10% fee-for-service. We will always have a fee-for-service component here in South Carolina. We have gone from 0% of inpatient insertions to now about 16%. We think that's pretty great in a short period of time. We would like to see that higher. Next slide. This looks specifically at white bagging. This has been a phenomenon for us in, uh, I believe it was March of 2000 last year. So we've got about 15, 16 months under our belt. We released another bulletin, another opportunity for the providers to not have to put that money up front when they wanted a LARC. And I'll go into that. But here is right now, as of June 2015, we've had a shift in the way that our providers are ordering these LARCs. This is outpatient only. You cannot do specialty pharmacy in inpatient. But right now, 36% are ordering it through the white bagging, that is a pharmacy term, process. Next slide. So here is a little bit about the bulletin, why it's helping the providers. Next slide. We will reimburse 
that is we as in Medicaid being fee-for-service or managed care, for outpatient LARCs, when you bill it through either our PBM, our Pharmacy Benefit Manager for fee-for-service, or one of the six specialty pharmacies for the MCOs, we also continue to allow for the buy and bill benefit. How this works is that the provider picks up the phone, calls, let's just use an example, CVS Caremark, and says, I have a patient, Medicaid patient, ID number 12345, and I want a LARC shipped to my office for BZ tomorrow. The specialty pharmacy bills the MCO or the fee-for-service for the cost of that LARC, so there's no money out of the pocket for the physician, and the LARC arrives the next day to the physician's office with that patient's name on it. So what we've found is that the providers only now have to bill us for the insertion, and this has helped with out-of-pocket money for their practice. And again, if you're in an MCO, you bill their pharmacy. Next slide. You can't double dip. <laughs> you can only bill us for the insertion if you've used this white bagging policy. For us in South Carolina, this could vary depending on your state, but we developed a 30-day policy with the specialty pharmacy and with the provider. So the provider has 30 days after they get the, the LARC to insert it or they just return it to the specialty pharmacy cr for credit. Our original review of our internal claims, that would be just for fee-for-service, show that this has not been an issue, meaning that the LARCs have been inserted. And that's probably um, kudos to the doctor's office, too, for increasing some educational opportunities to make sure the mom comes back. Next slide. So what are the cost benefits of LARCs versus oral contraceptives? And this is just a few slides. I can go in more detail if they're Q&A, but just to keep us on schedule. Uh, we wanted to see what, thank you for the next slide. We wanted to see what the cost is uh, for an unintended pregnancy. And looking at oral contraceptives, again, this is particular to South Carolina, and our average net price for OCs is about $23. The average net price for a LARC is $581, and that includes what you see below, administration insertion. And this is key, but assuming that the patient uses that LARC for the full period of time which is indicated, look at the price per month for the OC at $23.38 versus the LARC at $11.57. Next slide. So we take it a step further. And again, our failure rate here um, for our two top LARCs, which would be Nexplanon and Marina, are anywhere from 0 0.05 to 0.8. We do have all of the LARCs being utilized, however. And then if we look at what the weighted failure rate is for all of those LARCs, it's 0.15. We know from the literature that oral contraceptives have a 9% failure rate within the first year based on typical patterns. And we also know from the source at the bottom of this slide that the cost for an unintended pregnancy is estimated at $10,000. That's for a publicly funded birth. So next slide. We take all that into consideration now and we add the cost of the contraceptive failure and the LARC becomes even a better picture when you're looking at failed pregnancies. For the first year cost, including the cost of an unintended pregnancy, the failure rate for uh, OC is $1,180 and a LARC is 596, almost double. Next slide. Last one is just to tell you uh, very briefly about our strategic plans for BOI here as, as it relates to LARC. Obviously, we want to increase the utilization for inpatient and outpatient. Key is the partnerships that we've already established. We want to improve those and take an even deeper dive into see where we might focus some of our efforts. Very big here is the development of a LARC toolkit. This will be a distribution, uh, Deborah Billings, who uh, 
works actually not with the agency but is on the phone with us. She is um, spearheading along with BOI the opportunity to develop not only an online educational tool for LARC that includes talking about it pre um, delivery, everything you ever want to know A to Z, but also including a video for LARC insertion, is working on this toolkit. I've seen the first draft. We're going to release this at our fourth annual BOI symposium, uh, which is here in Columbia in November. Uh, this will be free of cost. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, Debbie and her team have been working very hard along with Monty to, to make this happen. So um, exciting stuff there. We also have the availability of a mobile 18-wheeler, which is why we call it the Sim Coach instead of a Sim Lab. Uh, DHHS here through BOI is under contract for two years to be able to use this Sim Coach uh, from one of our largest hospitals in the state to travel around to all 44 of our birthing hospitals, uh, not only to talk about LARC insertion and do some training, but also to look at supporting vaginal birth or decreasing the C-section rate, as well as some of the other things that we have going on with BOI. Uh, the presentation will be made another update on LARCs at the symposium. And then last but not least, we want to expand our data collection uh, to include some quality measures, how this has affected postpartum visits and, and pregnancies. Next slide. So thank you for your time. Um, a lot of people have slides that have their children or cats or dogs on it. And so I just have my name and to tell you that BZ is secret code for baby sister. Uh, it's not my real name, but I was blessed with that many, many years ago. So thank you very, very much again for the opportunity to present. And now uh, it's my honor to hand it over to Deborah Kane. All right. Thanks, BZ and Greta, all that spoke before me. I, I think that um, if one message you'll hear from me and from other presenters is the importance of leadership and relationships. I think that without relationships, we would not achieve the success that we have achieved in Iowa. And I really want to acknowledge the, the folks on our team here at the Iowa Department of Public Health, the work that we're doing with Iowa Medicaid, but also as others have mentioned, the leadership of the Division of Reproductive Health at CDC and also the population affairs. Really all this would not happen without us coming together. So our story actually is relatively short um, in terms of the history of unbundling the LARC insertion from the global code for um, delivery. We had a, a quite a simple process. And really what helped it was the relationship that I mentioned. Um, we've had a long history of a maternal health task force where the Iowa Department of Public Health works with Iowa Medicaid Enterprise to talk about the needs of the Medicaid population. And we work together to link the um, birth data to claims data to explore access to care and other needs among our um, Medicaid population. And also with this meeting, we have many opportunities to engage with providers and with other stakeholders. So again, in terms of unbundling, ours was very simple. Uh, here is the timeline. Uh, Dr. Barfield from CDC sent an email um, to myself, and I forwarded that to our Medicaid director. That was on October 31st of 2013. Within just a few months, the informational letter was developed and sent out to providers to allow them to bill separately for a LARC insertion. This letter was sent out in February with implementation in March. So you can see I have a link to the letter, but I also will show you the letter. <clears throat> Essentially, um, what the letter allowed was to separate um, LARC insertion, both for the device and for the insertion, separate that from the global bill. And in our case, how this was achieved was to use codes that would be outpatient codes, even though the service was provided inpatient. But as you can see, it was a very 
truly simple process of communicating, you know, working with the Medicaid director, providing him with um, literature to support the decision, um, and also to discuss how this might be accomplished um, through the work that South Carolina does and that others have done. And now that the, um, it was implemented in March, other work that's happening in Iowa uh, to strengthen or to let providers know about the service, uh, Steph Trustee is our maternal health consultant with the Title V agencies and, our, and on our perinatal team. And she's worked with a number of agencies throughout the state, for example, billing support at the University of Iowa. But also, um, she's coordinated a number of educational seminars. For example, one of our big group providers is Unity Point. You can see from this slide that she has worked with them to reach out to a number of different folks to give physicians and nurse managers on the units information about how to carry out this um, new code. I think BZ really brought up a lot of good points in terms of saying there are many moving parts, even though we um, have the informational letter and physicians can bill for this service, there are so many other stakeholders involved, the folks at the hospital, the pharmacy, so we are working on spreading the word. Um, Steph also met with staff at the Spencer Hospital, which is one of our level one hospitals, and their OB um, folks are very interested in implementing this um, um, service. But another thing that we're really excited about is the family practice residency program in the northwest part of our state, which serves a maybe over a thousand Medicaid moms a year, is very interested in immediate postpartum LARC insertion. So we've begun to work with them and to provide training. And I, I don't know about in other states, but you know, a fair number of our um, families receive OB services from family practice. So we think this is a really wonderful um, connection to, to form and to increase um, capacity with regard to LARC insertion in the immediate postpartum period. So another thing that we've been working on is we want to see, well, are hospitals billing for this? Are they getting reimbursed? And what we did in, for 2014, looking at that data, is as I mentioned, we do an annual linkage between Medicaid claims data and our birth certificate based on these paternal delivery diagnostic related groups. And so we've added a request for immediate postpartum LARC insertion, the codes for that, to this request so we can look at deliveries, link that to the birth certificate, and get some idea of the characteristics of the women who are obtaining this service, but also to look at what sites are actually um, providing the immediate postpartum LARC insertion. Thanks to the work of our CSTE fellow, Brittany Fredrickson, we were able to begin to explore this. This is um, the unlinked data, but we can see that we're starting to um, see some LARCs being inserted three days of postpartum. But I think what's interesting here, too, is we can also see prescriptions and paid claims for most and moderately effective methods of contraception, which I think is really exciting to see that women are getting that service before they leave the hospital. And we're also looking at this um, 60 days postpartum to continue to monitor the service to Medicaid moms. So what are our next steps? Well, of course, we'll continue to monitor uptake and revisit our data quest request to be sure that we're getting all the information we need. We also really see this as coinciding with the work we're doing with COIN in terms of reducing premature delivery and infant mortality. And I suspect many of you are also invo involved in the COIN and can see how this work dovetails really nicely in both areas. We will continue to follow up with hospitals and providers. And one thing that will be really, a, oh, I guess, a new and interesting challenge in Iowa in 2016 is that Medicaid is shifting from fee-for-service to a managed care environment. And we'll have four managed care organizations taking over um, Medicaid services in 2016. So we're going to need to um, examine how we will work with them. I think BZ and 
you brought up some really great ideas in terms of um, the work you're doing with MCOs. So um, we may be in touch again um, to learn about your process. I think that is all I have for now. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ellen Pliska, who will coordinate the question and answer session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. This is actually Courtney Bartlett. I'm the Senior Analyst of Primary Care here at AFSCO, and I'm going to help facilitate our Q&A session. Um, just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat box located on your screen. And you may also ask a question via phone. I'm going to quickly turn it over to Darla to give us some instructions on how to ask audio questions. Darla? If you wish to ask an audio question, Simply press star, then the number 1 on your telephone keypad. Once again, that's star 1. Thank you, Darla. Um, so now um, we'll start with some of the chat questions because we do have several that came in during the presentation. Um, our first question I think could be directed to any of the presenters. Um, asking about, in Brooklyn, we have seen an increase of STDs and sexual activity beginning at age 10. What do you recommend in terms of assisting with the decrease of trends? And also, what do you recommend um, to telling people who are resistant to having things inside their bodies as a form of birth control? This is Greta in Colorado. In regards to the second question, um, I, you know, ultimately the bottom line is, is it's always about choice. But what we found in Colorado, we thought, you know, we kind of thought among particular populations or something like that, that there would be a lot of resistance. And when people have an opportunity to really understand their options and talk through and have all their questions answered, a lot of their concerns go out the window. But the bottom line is too, a lark isn't going to be for everybody. And so again, you know, making the choices available, making sure that they're making an educated, informed choice that's right for them is key. Thanks, Greta. Um, we also have another question for Colorado. Um, do you have any data on lark removal? and or how long women are using LARC? Um, we don't have any statewide good data on that just because we're limited in what we're able to collect on our end. Our medical director who works at the University of Colorado Hospital and works with um, one of the Title X clinics there as well as another um, outpatient clinic has done some studies that show the continuation rates are for a year, I believe they're 85%, and beyond that, they go down a little bit to say 80 or 75%. Um, so they're, the continuation rates are amazing. And I would say the data that we do have reflects similar trends, much higher than oral contraceptives for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a question for BZ. Is the 90-10 match a federal agreement, or does the match vary from state to state? That is a match that is a federal agreement for family planning. So it should be for each state. The same thing. Okay. Thank you, BZ. Um, another question for Greta. Are there any problems with WIC adjusting to the drop in their numbers? Um, they've, I can't speak completely, but I do know that it's something they've been struggling with. And from what I've understood when they've talked is that WIC numbers kind of across the country have been going down, but we've seen kind of a quicker, bigger drop than most other states. And they're certainly adjusting, but they, they're, they're still able to deliver the services to everybody who needs them. So while staffing patterns at some of the health departments and things may be having to shift, the services are getting out there as they're needed. Okay, thank you. Courtney, this um, is, can I comment on uh, Rebecca's absolutely. question? 
on uh, FQACs. In South Carolina, we do reimburse for the device to the FQHC, but they cannot bill us for the insertion. So they only can, in bill, can bill us the encounter rate and, and get the device with that paid as well. Thanks. Thanks, Susie. Um, someone asked what the DRG is. Susie, I believe that was in your presentation. The diagnostic code, um, that's one of the things that um, a DRG is, there's a DRG payment for birth, so that is all wrapped up. A diagnostic related group is a fancy title with a, an acronym where a lot of things that happen within the hospital, let's just say in this case for that birth, is wrapped into one payment in a DRG. So in the past, that device for um, um, LARC was included in the DRG, and hospitals weren't getting paid because nobody was going to do it. They were getting paid very, very small amount if they were going to do it inpatient. So this way, when we say it's paid outside the DRG, that means it's paid separately from the actual cost that we get from the hospital for that delivery. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll pause just a minute, and Darla, do we have any questions on the phone? We have no audio questions at this time. Okay, thanks. Um, so our next question via the chat box, I think this could be for any of the presenters. Um, so those you probably know, the National um, AAP endorses LARC. Our chapter in Illinois is interested in being more involved in this effort. How do we go about doing so, and who might we contact? Uh, this is Beezy. I will offer up uh, Illinois if you'd like to contact me and give you just some um, ideas of what we did with AAP in, in South Carolina. We were fortunate, very fortunate actually, to have the past national president, Dr. Marion Burton, of AAP be our Medicaid medical director, uh, which w gave us a lot of insight into uh, what would work in our state and other states. He actually just passed away um, less than a month ago, but uh, I'd be glad to elaborate a little bit more on that if you want to give me a call or an email. This is Debbie in Iowa. I think also touching base with your ACOG person, um, whoever is the leader in the state, uh, that would be very helpful, as well as a Title X person. I think all of those groups would really be supportive um, to the AAP and would be able to connect you with a physician champion. I mean, one thing I didn't mention is the importance of a physician champion. In our state, we have someone from the ACOG who, or an obstetrician who is one of the champions at the site where we're working. So I would recommend those two groups as groups to reach out to in your state. We also have a maternal fetal medicine consortium in South Carolina. I'm not sure if that's available in other states, uh, but I would add that group um, to the list as well for AAP to contact. Thank you both. And just as a reminder, um, we will be sharing um, the participants' presentations and contact information as well as a recording of this webinar, which will be available on our website um, if you'd like to get in touch with them. And I see Marina Chabot has her hand raised. Uh, Marina, if you have a question, feel free to press star 1, and the um, operator will get you queued up. Um, or you can type it in the chat box. In the meantime, um, the next question is for Colorado. What are some of the data points you feel are most important to collect at the outset? Um. <coughs> It's been very, very helpful for us to be able to tie the patient demographic data to users. We can't tie it to insertions just based on how we collect the data. If we could, it'd be amazing. Um, and then looking at what state data is available to has been really um, key for us, so making sure that we've, we've added state added questions about um, contraceptive use to our BRFIS survey for adults, and then it also gets asked um, through our version of the youth risk behavior survey. 
Um, so those are two really helpful things. And then we use our PRAMS data and our um, abortion data and our birth certificate data um, a lot with all of this. But I would say having that demographic data tied to usage has really been key to what we've been able to analyze and, and, and knowing kind of where the trends are shifting and what we're seeing. So that's age, race, ethnicity, location, county of residence, um, that kind of thing. Thanks, Greta. Um, going along with um, the data topic, um, this is a question for all three of you. Are you adding a question to your PRAM to assess how often women are being offered placement of an IUD or implant prior to hospital discharge? We call, Here in Colorado, we haven't talked about adding that, but it would be cool to know. We haven't, uh, this is Debbie in Iowa, we have not done that yet either, but I think that would be an interesting piece to examine also. And in South Carolina, to my knowledge, we will look at that as well. Thank you. Another question for Greta. Can you elaborate on the workarounds for the Rural Health Clinic and FQHC encounter rates for LARC insertion reimbursement? Yeah. Um, so I think BZ mentioned this a little bit too a minute ago. Um, what we were hearing, um, so the FQHCs and the rural health centers get paid, regardless of what they do, a standard encounter rate. For FQs here in Colorado, I think it's usually around $150 per visit. For rural health centers, it's much lower. It's usually around $80. That includes any, any medication or anything that's dispensed at the visit. So for a LARC device, it, would, it technically would be included in that rate. And what we were hearing from providers was that they, couldn't, they wouldn't offer them because they, they wouldn't get paid for them and they just couldn't absorb that amount of cost. And so um, our Medicaid office here in Colorado was able to add, I don't know if it was through a state plan amendment or what the exact methodology was, and I could certainly find out and share that um, if people are interested. But they had to get approval from the feds to pay the rural health centers separately. So they'll bill for the visit, which they'll still, re regardless of what they're doing, they'll receive that standard encounter rate. So, you know, it doesn't matter if they're doing an IUD insertion, implant insertion, or something else. But then they would um, get separately reimbursed for the actual device. I think we would like to see the same process in place for FQHCs, and, and that does happen in some other states. Currently, our Medicaid um, office doesn't feel like that's appropriate for Colorado, so we're still kind of in conversation with that, but on the rural health side, they're able to do that, and I don't have the details on billing, whether there's a modifier or something that they have to add, or just whether the um, J code for the device will trigger it automatically, so I don't know the details on it. Okay, thanks, Greta. Um, as, uh, Darla, are there any questions on the phone? There are no audio questions in the queue. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question. I'm not sure who this is for. Are those continuation rates just quoted for teens or for the 15 to 24 age group? You know who, who was talking about continuation rates? Or Janice, if you want to let us know who that question was for. I think it might be for think you, I, I, Yeah, I think that was me. Um, the continuation rates are for everyone. The clinic where they were done it primarily serves 15 to 24 or 24 and under, um, but it's for anyone who was there and received services. Okay, thank you. Um, we don't have any other questions at this time. I actually have a quick question for BZ, and then if anyone has any last minute burning questions they want to type in um, while we're doing this question, feel free to do that. Um, BZ, what would you say is the first step for a state that's interested in paying for immediate postpartum LARCs? 
The first step would be to get your ammunition together. I wouldn't go straight to the Medicaid director until I had some facts about what the population in the state looks like for teen pregnancies, what the costs are for pregnancies in the state, know what your percent of births are actually Medicaid so you can talk about how your policy can affect that for the unintended pregnancies. I would also say, again, and we've, we've talked about collaboration and we've talked about stakeholders, is get a group of people around the table who, and it doesn't have to be a lot of people, but who are going to be people who will do shout outs for you and go to other physicians around the state who can then listen to what these clinical champions have to say about why it's a good thing to have a LARC inserted inpatient and know the facts up front about what the negatives are going to be. I think I said that in the presentation. But I will tell you from our perspective as a Medicaid director uh, reporting directly to him, his time is extremely valuable just like yours is. In our state, our budget for Medicaid is uh, over $7 billion. So there's a lot to consider when you go and uh, go fully armed uh, with a small team. Thank you. Thanks, BZ. That's great. And I, when I was looking at that slide that you showed with the numbers, um, that speaks volumes. And I think being able to make the business case for it is such a, a valuable thing. Um, we do have one other question. Um, one of the presenters mentioned they are not covering an office visit and the insertion removal on the same day. Is this a cost issue or is there another reason behind not paying for both on the same day? I believe she might be referring to an FQHC. Um, just as, as clarification, I don't know if Cherie can can type that in. You, if you're outpatient, uh, we will pay for the insertion and the device. But if you are an FQHC, you can only bill us the encounter rate and the device. You cannot bill a third charge, which is the insertion. I'm not sure if that clears that up. Okay, thanks, BZ. Um, Sheree, feel free to type in if you have any other questions. Um, just one last check on the audio line, Darla. Do we have any questions waiting there? We have no questions in the audio queue. Okay, thank you. Courtney, if I may add just one piece of interesting information that other states might want to look at for their Medicaid policy. Absolutely. When we started to look at the removal, because the question came up, well, what if the LARC um, comes out, or what if the mom comes back after two months after insertion and says, you know, I've changed my mind or I have a new partner or whatever, will Medicaid pay for that removal? And if that same mom comes back, let's say two months later, and says, well, I've changed my mind, I want it back, will we pay for a second, et cetera, device? And we're looking at our policy to potentially change that. But as it currently stands, um, a mom, we do not have a limit on the number of LARCs that a mom can get or the removal. What we are focusing on is an improved educational aspect from the provider's standpoint to make sure that when the decision is made, it's, as someone mentioned earlier, it's the right decision for that person and that we don't have that uh, where Medicaid's paying for three LARCs for the same woman in a one-year period. But that's just a heads up as you develop your, your policy plan. You might want to uh, make sure that you either have a limit or draw some sort of limits around uh, just how much and how often you will insert. Thanks. Thanks, BZ. Um, it looks like Cherie just chatted in um, just to confirm you're able to pay the office visit and E&M code and the J code and insertion 
on the same day. Um, she says that they are paying for all three, so just wondering if you have any guidance. For us, we are paying for the office visit, the E&M code, and the J code, and the insertion. That is correct for South Carolina. Okay. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions. So I want to thank everyone again for joining us today. Um, as Lisa mentioned earlier, you're, you will be immediately directed to an evaluation at the end of the webinar. And we ask that you please do fill this out as it um, provides us with very useful information for our future projects. I'd like to sincerely thank Hertha for sponsoring this webinar and also our speakers, Dr. Larry Wolk, Ellen Pliska, Greta Klingler, BZ Gazay, and Deborah Kane. Um, we really appreciate them taking the time to share their work with us today. Um, and as I mentioned, the presentation will be available on our website within the next two weeks. The web address is on your screen now. And also, we encourage you to check our newsletters and website for more information regarding upcoming webinars. If you'd like to, to subscribe to AFSO's Primary Care and Prevention Network newsletter, or if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to contact me. My contact information is on the screen as well. And we do hope that all of the listeners will use this webinar as a resource. And feel free to share the link with others once it is available. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.